Luke 19, why don't you turn in your Bibles? New Testament, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Luke 19, starting in verse 35. I guess the kids' church has already been dismissed. Okay, Lynn? Okay, good deal. So this is Jesus' uh, triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And he tells his disciples to go and get this, this colt, this donkey that's never been ridden before. And they say, we're just supposed to go to this place and untie this thing and take it. He's like, well, if somebody's going to try to stop us, they're going to say something. Just, just tell them the Lord has need of it. It'll be fine. So they go and do that. And the owners come out and say, what, what are you doing? And they say, well, Lord, the Lord needs it. Oh, okay. Well, go ahead. And so this is where we pick up in the story here, verse 35. And they brought it to Jesus. And throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples, so this isn't just you know, his, his 12, there's many more disciples beyond that that have seen Jesus' miracles and heard his preaching and begun to follow him and want to come and see what's going on with him. The whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice. Here it is. And praise God with a loud voice, Pam. There it is. For all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Verse 39. And some of the Pharisees. Man, the Pharisees know how to ruin a good time, don't they? They know how to rain on the parade. They know how to bring in that religion and that judgment and condemnation. Right in the midst of rejoicing. Right in the midst of extravagant worship, they want to wag their finger, they want to criticize. <clears throat> what did they say? He said, teacher, rebuke your disciples. They recognized, they knew the law, they knew the prophets. They're like, what they're saying is reserved for the Messiah. <laughs> it's reserved for God alone. And they're saying this to you? You better tell them to quit. Verse 40, Jesus answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. So, and we'll read some more as we go here in just a minute. But this is Jesus' sort of Passion Week, as, as we have come to label it, where he's beginning his final seven days before he's crucified. Coming in at Passover time. So they'd have all the Passover lamps being inspected, ready to be slaughtered and sacrificed. And this is the scene. This is where Jesus comes in. At this particular side of the city, this particular gate, where you would probably be able to smell and hear what's going on with all these lambs getting ready to be taken to the slaughter. And then here comes Jesus right there as the Lamb of God, preparing to go to his own death as the sacrificial lamb, the substitutionary sacrifice. No longer would they have to bring the lambs in, go to the high priest, do the whole thing on the Day of Atonement. Jesus was going to be that ultimate sacrifice. So he's fulfilling Scripture, and the Pharisees know it. Of course, they're not in agreement with it. They're in rebellion. They're in their pride, saying, you've got to stop. So my whole thing is this. Jesus had a purpose. Why did he choose a colt that had never been ridden on? Why did he choose a donkey? This was symbolic in their day, in their culture, that if a king was to ride into a city... If he was to ride in on a horse, on a stallion, on a majestic steed, this was most of the time not a good sign. This was he's coming in war, he's coming in battle. But if he comes on a donkey, it means he's coming in peace. So here comes Jesus coming in, about to reconcile people to God, that people can have peace with God, can have right relationship with him. He's going to be that Passover lamb that's going to make a way for people to come to know the Father in an intimate way. What a, what a scene. I mean, imagine being there. What would it have been like? You know, you see the, the depiction there on the video to be in the midst of this type of environment where there's rejoicing and yet there's rebuking. There's this controversy surrounding this man who's been doing these miracles and casting out demons and speaking and teaching with the authority that no one's ever heard before. And everyone's in an uproar. Everyone's coming to the temple at this time to offer their sacrifices. People from all over would be here. What a crazy scene. Jesus, once again, is making a declaration because before this time, Jesus would tell people, hey, just kind of go your way. 
You don't have to, you know, you can kind of be quiet. Remember how Jesus was like that? And he would even silence the demons. He would say, we know who you are. You're the Christ. You're the Son of the living God. And he would tell them to be quiet. But this time, he's not telling people to be quiet. He's letting the praises erupt. He's letting them speak of who he is and worship him in this moment. He's letting, allowing it to be released openly. So now he's publicly displaying. He's publicly fulfilling scripture in a way that is is blunt, that is right in your face. It's no longer hidden or symbolic or any doubt about it. He's doing this thing. Zechariah 9, 9, this is what it says. It says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. And the people were doing that, weren't they? They were rejoicing. They were shouting. For see, your king comes to you righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So here's Jesus making his public claim now to be the Messiah and to be the king of Israel. And many of the people are recognizing it. The sad thing is, is that by the end of the week, the same ones that are crying out glory and Hosanna would be the ones saying crucify him. How interesting how the tides could turn. Because what they expected was for him to go ahead and establish the kingdom, for him to go ahead and, and defeat the Romans. They didn't, they didn't, you know, really want this sacrificial lamb thing to happen. It was about, you need to come and defeat those who have been oppressing us. You need to set us free. That's what we've been waiting on, a mighty warrior, a, a, a political figure, a kingly person to come in and to eradicate the Romans and to establish a kingdom so that we could rule and reign with you. Like, it's time. We're the chosen ones. It's time for us, as the chosen ones, to dominate. I mean, that was their attitude, that was their mindset. And in many ways, that's, that was biblical, that was scriptural. That's what many of the prophets had said. Jesus came, of course, when he talked to Pilate in other conversations, he talked about, I came, not a kingdom that's of this world, right? But a kingdom of heaven, a kingdom that's in the spirit. I came to conquer sin. I came to conquer hell. I came to get the keys back that Adam gave away in the garden, right? So many of them missed it in Jesus' first coming. So it's a significant situation that's going on here. So I want to look at some of the detail as Jesus is making this public display in front of all these people right at the Passover time. What's going on here as people are doing the branches and they're doing the cloaks and he talks about the rocks crying out. And so what we'll focus on probably is not so much the rocks. I mean, because well, we'll see what happens, but I want to talk about the cloaks first. Oftentimes we focus on the palm branches because we've named it Palm Sunday. And the palm branch is a symbol of victory. And of course, that's what was happening is Jesus is writing in, I'm gonna, I'm gonna declare victory over Satan, right? Over sin, over death, hell, and the grave. That was happening. So it was right for them to say, okay, but of course they wanted to have victory over the Romans, like we just got through talking about. But nonetheless, Jesus was gonna have his victory. Okay, so the palm branch thing, that's fantastic, and oftentimes we focus on that, but I want to focus on something maybe that we miss oftentimes, this idea of them spreading their cloaks on the road. What was that about? Why were they doing that? Once again, this is a tradition. This was in their culture. Uh, whenever a king would come in, it was a way to honor the king. It was a way to pay homage, to pay your due respect, to lay your cloak on the ground as he made entrance. So they're doing that. They're doing it in their word. They're doing it with the palm branches. They're doing it with their cloaks. They're shouting. They're paying homage. They're recognizing, okay, here comes Jesus. Royalty, fulfilling scripture. Not the way they thought he was going to come at the end of the week, but they thought this was the beginning. He's going to come in in just a minute. He's about to turn everything upside down. And of course, he did turn everything upside down in the temple, didn't he? With the tables and the money changes and the animals, and he made a, that guy made a whip and drove those people out of there. And I'm sure maybe they were like, "Okay, is this it? All right, do we? You know, Peter's probably got his sword ready. Let's go." Like, wait a minute now. And then Jesus all of a sudden says, well, "My house is supposed to be a house of prayer, right? You guys have twisted it into a den of thieves, a den of robbers." And we'll get there in just a minute. So this spreading of cloaks was an act of homage, but how is it an act of homage? What is the deeper meaning behind this? So in Exodus 22, we can get some insight into this, where this actually originated. Uh, so here's the thing. The outer garment, it was used as a covering 
Think about this. Once again, think about the symbolism here. The outer garment, so people would have an outer garment, was they're called a cloak, and then they would have an inner garment. So you basically have like a jacket and t-shirt type of situation happening here in our, you know, lingo today. The outer garment was used as a covering to sleep under at night. It could not be withheld from a debtor overnight. Now think about that for a second. If if someone was in debt to somebody else and they, they gave them their outer garment, say, I'm going to pledge, I'm going to pay this debt, hold on to my coat. And their coats were important. It was a covering. It was what they used to. It says it was a blanket at night and all this. And it actually represented oftentimes who they were and identified them. We'll get to that in a minute. You had Roman soldiers that wore a particular outer garment. You had the Pharisees that wore a particular outer garment. You even had beggars that would wear a particular outer garment that would identify them in their station or status in life which is important to understand the symbolism as we get into it here in just a minute. So to give a cloak, it said, now at nighttime, if that person that's in debt to you, you need to make sure and give their cloak back to them. It's their covering. You are not allowed. It was in the law in the, in the Exodus. You've got to give that cloak back to them. When you're making a pledge, you're going to pay your debt, but that person that you, that has that, that you owe, they're going to give you your cloak back before nightfall. Just an interesting picture, isn't it? So here's what it says, actually, in Exodus 22, verse 26 and 27. If you ever take your neighbor's garment as a pledge, you shall return it to him before the sun goes down. Listen to this. For that is his only covering. It is his garment for his skin. What interesting language. It's a pledge. It's a covering. It's a garment for his skin. What will he sleep in? And it will be that when he cries to me, well, this is the Lord speaking here, I will hear, for I am gracious. What an amazing piece of scripture. So think about this. This is symbolic then of the recognition, okay, for us, that we are unable to provide for ourselves a covering for our sin. We have a debt. Just like there's a debt, I'm going to pledge to you my, my garment, my cloak. We have a debt that we cannot pay. Only Jesus, through his gracious sacrifice, can pay our debt and provide atonement, which is covering for our sin. Atonement for us. We have no ability to provide ourselves a covering. No longer do we have to go to sleep at night. Get this then. No longer do we have to go to sleep at night covered in shame and condemnation of our own garment, right? That's what we were wearing before. We know now that in the cold, dark night of our soul, Christ came to break every chain and to pull us out of darkness and into his marvelous light and his unconditional, everlasting love. Can somebody say amen? That's what's going on with this cloak. He's given us beauty for ashes and joy for mourning. He has taken our filthy rags of sin and given us his robe of righteousness. Think about that. He's pledged himself to us, dying on that cross. This is how much I love you. This is how far I'm willing to go to show you, to bring you into relationship with me. I've pledged my life to you. My blood is a covering now for your sin. It's atoned for your sin. That word atonement, Think about at one, if you were to spell that out, at one minute. We're able to be one with him now, connected with him, spirit to spirit, son and daughter, for real. At one minute. That's what's going on here with this covering. What an amazing picture. So people's outer garments, as I said before, also identified them. Whether you're a soldier, you're a rabbi, you're a merchant, you're a shepherd, whatever. You're going to have a different type of outer cloak, this garment. So think about that. The one story that I got pictured in my mind as I'm, I'm reading this, studying this, I thought about blind Bartimaeus. You guys remember that story? Jesus is coming through his part of the, the town, and he hears the crowds, he hears what's going on, and he cries out. He's heard about Jesus, and he says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Remember that? And his disciples and everything are like, hey, man, you need to quiet down. Jesus is coming through. He doesn't have time for you, whatever. 
And the Bible says that he cried out all the more, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and turned aside to him. And the Bible says that when that happened, blind Bartimaeus got up and he shed his outer garment. He threw that cloak off that identified him as a blind man that his only means of sustenance was to beg from other people. And he's about to encounter Jesus, the son of David, who's been doing miracles. And he says, I'm throwing off this thing that used to identify me. I'm not just a blind beggar anymore. Think about that. That's what's happening here. The symbolic situation with these outer garments and cloaks being laid down. This is symbolic of us, once again, throwing off our old man, our old nature, our old identity, our old thinking, our old ways. Knowing that we are stepping into Christ and therefore being made into a new creation. So the idea here is that we have to surrender ourselves, our lives, and who we are to Jesus. And here's the thing. We're made in his image anyway, right? Why not go ahead and submit to the process of being conformed more and more into his image and likeness? He wants to beautify us with salvation, to change us from the inside out, to make us into a pure and spotless bride who can testify, as these people were, to his love, goodness, grace, and faithfulness. And here's the thing. When you're no longer identified with your old self and your past and everything else, and now you're identified with Jesus and you're pledging yourself to him, you're throwing down that cloak, that outer garment, saying, I'm no longer that person that I used to be. Right? When you're identified and pledged to Jesus, who cares about the rest of the world? Who cares about what anybody else thinks? Who cares about their opinion? Why are you trying to impress and please them? You belong to him. Your identity can't be touched by them, right? There's something that can happen when you're covered, when you're identified in Christ, when you have this revelation, when you have this relationship. It's out of that place that then we can testify. We are a new creation, and then it begins to shine forth out of us. Now we're reflecting who Christ is. It's no longer I that lives, right? But Christ who lives in me. In the life that I live, I live to the Son of God. I live in faith. Whether the people realized it or not, that this is what was going on with the laying down of their cloaks, the Holy Spirit is trying to let us know right now. This is what's going on in the Spirit. This is what we get to do today as we observe Palm Sunday. You got to throw up your palms already. Now the question is, are you willing to take off that outer garment? That covering, that provision, that thing that, that you're used to, that thing that you've walked in. Are you willing to throw that off? Submit to Jesus, surrender to Jesus. That's the question that all of us has to, have, to, have to ask, have to answer. It's a crazy thing, what's going on here in this story. So Jesus goes on as they're making this crazy display. In just a minute, Jesus is going to weep. You think all the people are rejoicing. They're saying you're king. You know, you got all these people following you. You know, isn't this the Father's will? Aren't you excited? And right after this, Jesus begins to weep. And then right after he's all weepy, he gets really, really angry. It's like, do we have a bipolar Jesus? Does Jesus not recognize what's happening here? Why are you up and down in this moment of triumph? What's happening? It's interesting. We're going to get to that. But I just want, I just want you to key in on that for a second. What, what emotions are being stirred in the Son of God? What things are he, are, is he thinking about? Because the people are thinking one thing, right? And he's thinking something else. There are some things that are hidden from their eyes. Even though they're fulfilling Scripture, you know, they're being used to fulfill Scripture. They're missing the point in a lot of ways. Jesus says the stones will cry out, okay? So Jesus is saying here, the people's acclamation should be encouraged, not suppressed. The people of Jerusalem are expressing great joy, and this joy is appropriate, and it's necessary. So much if they did not express this praise and this joy, it would be appropriate for even inanimate objects, like these stones, to fill the void. We know there are scriptures all throughout the Psalms that talks about the trees will clap their hands, right? The mountains will shout. 
all this language about rivers, all the, all the creation praising and worshiping God all throughout the Psalms. Even Colossians 1.16 says that all creation was actually made for God's glory. Everything was created in him, for him, through him, by him, right? Everything should declare his praise, everything in creation. But us, especially as humans who are the object of God's affection, the ones that he died for, the ones that he wants to put his spirit in, even more so should we be worshiping. But we're made for worship, made for representation. We're the ones who should be praising God. But the issue is this, is Jesus points to the rocks. Why would he point to the rocks? He could have pointed to lots of different things. Why make this statement? Why make this illustration? Jesus knows, right, that we have hearts of stone that need to be removed and replaced with the heart of flesh. He knows what's going on. That's the problem, is that we would oftentimes rather be silent in our pride, our complacency, our busyness, or selfishness, or we would, we would even rather throw stones at others because of our own insecurities, religious piety, or judgment, so that it takes the focus off of our lack of passion or devotion. That's what's going on with the Pharisees, right? Do anything they can to get the spotlight off of them, and always look at other people. Try to belittle them, whatever else. Prop themselves up by pointing out the flaws in everybody else. That's what goes on. And oftentimes Christians enter into that pharisaical spirit. Oftentimes people come to church and they want to size up the pastor. They want to size up the worship leader. They want to decide, is this my style? Is this this? Is this that? Is this a move of the spirit? And they get into that type of thing. They want to start to cast criticism. Start to throw stones. And the thing is, is the church supposed to be about our preferences and about people? Or are people just vessels, just pointing to Christ, right? Is it about gathering around Jesus and worshiping Him? Or does the lights and the music and this and that all have to be just right? Or if not, we'll go, right? So often we have that heart of stone. We have that carnal mind. We let other things get in from our past Situations where we've been hurt by pastors or churches or whatever else. And all of a sudden, because we're offended and we've been rejected, we reject other things. We get critical. Because we're critical of ourselves or we're critical of you know the fact that God allowed whatever to happen. And so now we're in this mindset. We're trapped in this. We can't help but look at everything and pass judgment on. It's a dangerous place to be because you'll miss God. You'll miss the healing. You miss what he wants to speak. We need God to take out the hard heart and replace it with a heart of flesh, which, guess what? He's eager and delighted to do. He wants to show mercy. He wants to pour out grace. He wants to get to the hardest of heart. He wanted to get to Saul and encounter him on that Damascus road. That was the one that was the most steeped in religious pride, killing and persecuting Christians. And knocked him off of his high horse, didn't he? <laughs> Some of us need to get off our high horse. Step into the light and hear the voice. And Paul responded, humbling himself, bowing down, saying, Lord, Lord. <laughs> Some of us need to pay attention. The thing about it is, once we allow God to do this heart surgery in us, he starts to rearrange things. Because here's the thing, Christ is also the cornerstone, right? In that day, in that time, the cornerstone was the foundational piece of a building that was put in first. And it, the walls would be joined to it. Everything would be measured. It was the plumb line for the rest of the building. Once again, get the picture here. Christ is supposed to be the cornerstone, Right? We're supposed to be the living stones that are being built upon the rock. Hello, built upon the rock. Is our house, is our heart, is our life being built upon the rock? Are we aligned with the cornerstone? Everything should be evaluated and measured against that cornerstone. We need to come into alignment with that. It shapes the rest of the structure and holds the whole thing together. If you decide to remove that cornerstone, the whole thing collapses upon itself. 
Jesus made reference to this. Peter makes reference to this. Actually, later on in Luke, in Luke chapter 20, we're in Luke chapter 19, but if you skip over to Luke chapter 20, Jesus actually is talking about himself as this cornerstone, as this rock. And he says in verse 18, whoever falls on this stone, once again, speaking of himself, will be broken to pieces, but on whomever it falls, it will crush him. You get to decide, do you want to fall on Jesus and humble yourself and be broken before him? If not, later on, that rock is going to come and crush you. You can receive mercy now if you humble yourself, be broken and open before him, or you're going to receive judgment later. That's what's going on here. He's the cornerstone. There is no other way. There's no other plumb line. There's not one righteous, not one holy, not one sinless, not one example like Jesus. And he calls us to follow him, to become like him, right? To do the things even that he does and even greater things. You're not going to be able to do those things unless you're connected to the cornerstone, unless he's the foundation. Unless your roots go into him, there's not going to be any fruit that's going to be able to come out. That's how it works. What are you building your life on? Because you're building your life on something. You're following something. You've got some kind of worldview, some kind of way that you make decisions. The thing is, is it based on Jesus and his word and his spirit? Or is it based on the culture? Is it based on fear? Is it based on money? Is it based on whatever? And I'm telling you today, God wants to remove those stones and remove that hardness of heart. He wants to align us with him. And not just that we would be individually aligned, but once again, Peter in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5 says, We are the living stones being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices. This is important because, once again, as individuals, there's some things that we can do. We have giftings and callings and assignments. And then as a body, as a corporate body, there's, there's assignments, there's bigger things, there's things that God wants to do. We're being built as a house, as an individual, but we're also being built as a house, as a congregation. Hello. We want to be these living stones. We want to worship. We want to align ourselves. We want to be in unity. We want to be walking in love and humility and servanthood. We want to be forgiving each other. We don't want to hold offense. We don't want to judge. We don't want to have any of that mess in. We want to deal with it. We want to be real. And that's the thing. We're, we're a pretty real, raw church. And, and, you know, you can take it or leave it. But it is what it is, you know. Hopefully we say what we mean and mean what we say. But I want to be built as a spiritual house, a priesthood that's offering spiritual sacrifices, pleasing and acceptable to God. I want to make sure that that's what we're about. That this is the cornerstone. This is what is aligning us. This is what we're focusing on. This is what we're allowing God to do in our midst. And it's going to take repentance once again. It's going to take acknowledging the ways that we've tried to build a house. The ways that we've held things against God or against other people. We've got to let go. We've got to let him clean the house. We've got to let him apply the standard. We've got to apply the blood. Amen? But once again, too often we're too busy throwing stones. But we're not supposed to be throwing stones. We're actually supposed to be removing stones. Isaiah 62 10 says, Go through, go through the gates, clear a way for the people, build up, build up the highway. Here it is, remove the stones and lift up a flag or a banner over the peoples. Isaiah 62 10. I don't know about you, but I want to be. A living fulfillment of that scripture. I really do. If God's saying, hey, you can go through the gates. And what are we supposed to be? Upon this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail. Guess what? Go through the gates. I've authorized you. I'm calling you to do it. I don't have to be afraid. No matter what the storms come, no matter what the enemy does, I'm built on the rock. He can come in like a flood. It doesn't matter. I'm going through the gates. He's given me authority. Clear a way for the people. Once again, 
I'm sure that as they're coming into town, people you know, are like, what's going on? Who's this? What's happening? The palm branches, the, the cloaks, this whole thing. Like, clear away. Here comes Jesus. We've got to do the same thing. We've been talking about this highway of holiness, right? The path of righteousness, the narrow road. Clear away for the people. Build up, build up the highway and remove the stones. We're to be removers of stones, not throwers of stones. And as we remove the stones, like as we get to help people deal with their issues, their bitterness, the strongholds, the things that, that have caused them to be offended and to get critical or to be hurt and wounded, we're going to help clear away those blinders, clear away those places of pain. We want to remove that. We want to identify. We want to pray. We want to release the Holy Spirit. We want to get them off of the sand of their old identity, their old ways, and put them on the rock. We want to say, come with us. We'll help hold you steady on this thing. It's a, I would argue that it's our responsibility to do that. We're supposed to be fulfilling the Great Commission, right? To make disciples. You, you can't make disciples because Jesus' call is to follow him. You're not going to be able to follow him unless you take off that outer garment and that cloak, right? Put that aside. Put all your, your, you deny yourself and you pick up your cross and you follow Jesus. And people have to be taught about the spiritual roots. They have to be taught about the blood of Christ. They have, and they have to be shown what it is to walk in truth, to walk in power and authority, to walk by the Spirit and not by the flesh, to walk by faith and not by sight. They have to be shown the love of Christ, the heart of God. That's what we're supposed to do. The same way that Jesus came to represent the heart of the Father, now he's passed it to us to also represent his heart. So we got to remove our stones. Let him do the heart surgery so that we can help remove other people's stones. And that what Jesus said, hey man, before you remove that splinter out of your brother's eye, you better get the plank that's in your eye. Right? Once again, let's not be as dumb as a box of rocks. Right? We're supposed to have the life of Christ. We're not supposed to be hopeless and depressed and this and that. Not that you're not going to go through seasons of sorrow and dealing with emotional you know, turmoil. But you don't stay there. You don't focus on that. We're, we're, here's the thing. Faith is not denying the facts. It's knowing the facts, but then applying faith in God's work to those facts. It's believing there's more. Believing that God wants to break through. This isn't my destiny. This isn't the only, this isn't the end of the story. I mean, sometimes, I don't know if you got little pebbles in here or if you got big boulders in here. Sometimes it's going to take some heavy lifting and you're going to need some brothers and sisters in Christ to come in there and help you get that out. Hello? And here's the thing. As we remove these stones, what, what's going to happen is as we see people come into the kingdom, as God starts to build the house, Man, it's going to cause us to take those stones and build altars. All it's going to do is increase our love, increase our devotion, increase our worship. Thank God that he's saving people. Thank God he's delivering people. Thank God he's healing people. And we'll just take these stones that were that were once the enemy had a grip. We kicked the enemy out, and now we're building altars with those stones. We used to be critical. We used to be this and that, have all this junk. God's cleared all that out. What the enemy meant for evil, God turned for good. And here it is as a testimony. Here's my stone. Let's build altars to God. He's melted and changed our hearts. And he's using us and our lives, our prayers, our worship, our testimonies to remove the strongholds, the blinders, the hindrances, all the stones, and to help to soften other hard hearts. That's what we want, right? When people come in here to so sense the presence and the love of God that their heart of stone gets melted. They leave here different. They don't leave here bitter and confused or more critical. They're like, wow. 
There's the spirit of the living God. There are sons and daughters in there. There's a unity. There's a, there's a love. There's a humility. There's a zeal. There's a passion. There's something of, of God. There's something of the kingdom. That's not shifting sand. That's a place where they're standing strong. They're anchored. Let me anchor myself. Let me get on the solid ground. That's what we want to see happen, right? Man, let them come in and throw off their cloaks, man. Throw off what used to identify them, what used to hold them back. Throw that out and begin to cry out. So the story, I'm going I'm to close here in just a second. The story of the, of the triumphal entry, I just want to read this to you, is one of contrasts. So we talked about the cloaks, we talked about the rocks. Think about this, once again, this whole picture. What is, what is God doing in the midst of this? These contrasts contain applications to us as believers. It's the story of the king who came as a lowly servant on a donkey, not a prancing steed, not in royal robes, but on the clothes. He came on the clothes of the poor and the humble. Jesus Christ comes not to conquer by force as earthly kings, but by love and grace and mercy and by his own sacrifice for his people. His is not a kingdom of armies and splendor, but of lowliness and servanthood. He doesn't conquer nations, but hearts and minds. His message is one of peace with God, not of temporal political peace. If Jesus has made a triumphal entry into our hearts, he reigns there in peace and love. And as his followers, we should be exhibiting these same qualities of humility, mercy, justice, sacrificial love, servanthood, kindness, generosity, so that the world will see the true king living and reigning in triumph in us. That's it, man. This is a story. We're in the storyline. Don't let the rocks cry out. Don't let that be your story. So real quick, let's read a little bit further. Jesus weeping over Jerusalem and Jesus cleansing the temple and we'll close. And there's a lot that I could say about this. We just don't have time. So verse 41 in Luke 19, go a little bit further down. When he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it. So now Jesus is, uh, in the other gospels, it talks about how he looked over, the, you know, he's looking over the, the, the place. He had a particular view. He had a perspective looking at the mountains and the valleys and different things. So he's having this panoramic view. Jesus is viewing the city. And what is his heart response to this? It says he wept over it. Saying, would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children with you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. What a stark statement. You did not know, you did not recognize the time of your visitation. Now that word visitation actually means inspection or investigation. Oftentimes we think visitation, and it can in other contexts, mean that the Holy Spirit is going to visit, move in power, outpouring. We think of those type of things when we think of visitation. We think of the manifest presence of God breaking out. But here, once again, Jesus is viewing, he's, he's making statements, he's inspecting and investigating. Here I am, let me see what kind of heart you have. Right? I came to save sinners, I came to those that know they're weak and broken and sick. I didn't come for the well, I didn't come for the religious, right? I'm investigating, I'm searching who's humble, right? Who's after truth? Who will submit to the will of the Father? Who is a real son and daughter? He's investigating these. That's what he's doing. He's searching. And he's finding among the religious leaders and the majority of the folks there that they are found wanting. They've got the hearts of stone. They've got all the blockages. They've got all the things. And so he weeps over them. He wanted, you know, other translations, you know, goes on and talks about how he wanted to gather them. As a hen gathers, you know, her chicks, but she wouldn't have it. I mean, Jesus' heart of compassion, I mean, he's, he's grieving, he's broken here over his people. 
I'm searching for a heart that belongs to me. I'm searching for a soft heart. And I'm finding so little. You know, yet all of you are rejoicing right now. And in just a few days, you're going to ask for them to crucify me. You did not know the time of your visitation. This was a, this was a heavenly, this was a, a, a Kairos time, an appointed time. Where God was doing something completely brand new, completely different. And because they didn't posture themselves right, they had all this pride and all this other stuff. How they had it figured out. They missed the Messiah. Right there in front of them with all this going on. Scripture being fulfilled. So right after that, then here we go. Verse 45, we're going to close. And he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold, saying to them, it is written. My house shall be a house of prayer, but you made the den of robbers. So he weeps with sorrow, then all of a sudden he gets fired up with anger and zeal. My house shall be a house of prayer, but you made it a den of robbers. And he was teaching daily in the temple, and the chief priests and the scribes and the principal men of the people were seeking to destroy him. But listen to this, but they did not find anything they could do, for all the people were hanging on his words. Oh, that we would be like that. Yes, let's rejoice and let's shout, but then are we also hanging on his words? <laughs> so here's what I want to say about these two realities happening with Jesus weeping and cleansing the temple. So directly following his entry, follow this line of thought. The people are celebrating. Jesus became overwhelmed with sorrow as he viewed the landscape, knowing the people's hearts and what was going to be ahead for them. Jesus had a deep longing in his heart to gather them in, but he had inspected and investigated their lives and found them wanting. And right after that, Jesus' zeal and anger overtakes him as he chastises the religious leaders for perverting the house of God. Listen to this. Here's the whole thing of what I'm saying. Perhaps the reason they missed their time of visitation was because they were not engaged at the heart level and were not functioning as the house of prayer that they were supposed to be. Think about that. My house is supposed to be a house of prayer. If you were in tune with me, in my spirit, if you were praying, if you were humbling yourself, right? You'd be hearing my voice. You'd be able to understand my ways. You'd be sensitive. You'd be tenderized. You'd be letting me do that heart surgery. You'd be in the place of prayer. You can't help. You're not going to change God. You get changed in the place of prayer. You're not twisting God's arm to get him to do something. He wants to pour out grace and do something in you. And all I'm saying is this. We would be wise not to make the same mistake so that we don't miss our time of visitation. Because how many of you know the Bible talks about he's going to pour out his spirit in the last days? Are we in the last days? Are we close to Jesus' return? Does he want sons and daughters to prophesy? Old men to dream dreams and young men to see visions? We're seeing little pockets of revival here and there. And there, are, there are dark things. There's a contrast that's going on with the world and the culture, the kingdom of darkness versus the kingdom of light. And God is allowing the wheat and tares to be raised up together. And God wants to, he wants to pour out. He wants to use his bride. He wants to refine us. He wants to remove these hearts. He wants to remove the heart of stone, everything that we talked about. That we would lay down our cloaks of religion, lay down our cloaks of pride, our, the, the, our old wineskins, all of that, the old mentalities, the old ways of doing things. Because he wants to do a new thing. He wants to visit. He's going to visit the earth in a way that we've never seen, in an unprecedented way. Let's not be like the Pharisees, right? And try to judge, well, that's not God, and I don't that God can't use that person, or it's not, or whatever it is. He's going to blow our minds with what he wants to do. Because he wants it to be him and him receiving the glory and not man's ways, but his ways. He wants to do things that are undeniable and it may look different, that may go against the grain, that may challenge us. But ultimately, he wants to bring us into a place of closeness and freedom, right, and power because we're vessels that can be trusted because we've allowed him to do the surgery. We've taken off the cloaks, all the things. We've made this house a house of prayer. 
We're not trying to steal the glory of God. We're not trying to do things our own way. What were they doing? They made it a place of business. Another translation says you made it a house of merchandise, essentially is what he says. So you come here to just do your quick exchange and then get out. So when we come to church, let's just do our quick exchange like a business transaction. Thank you, God. I'll see you next week. Put the money in the bucket. See you. Doing that, living that sort of shallow lifestyle, living that, you know, keeping on your outer cloak and yet still claiming to follow Jesus and all of that. You're robbing God of his glory in your life and in the life of the church. Let's don't be a den of thieves, a den of robbers. Let's not pervert this and get this off track and make it about something else. It's about him. It's about us being a royal priesthood. Offering to God spiritual sacrifices of prayer and worship. That has to be the cornerstone. That has to be the foundation. Let's stand. Are you guys in agreement with this? Yeah.